I'm Andrea Radiosevi, I'm an analyst, I'm the main analyst, the main researcher in, uh, at the European Policy Center, which is a think tank uh, headquarters in Brussels. We work for uh, European institutions, so please forgive me if I offer you a European perspective and not a local perspective or a national perspective, because uh, this is what we did in the last month. Well, today's topic. It's kind of a different topic. Uh, it has nothing to do with today's uh, Congress. I uh, am going to talk about geopolitics of technology. It's important to understand the dynamics of power when we talk about democracy and a power. And I'm going to pick a sentence that you mentioned before, how a power is distributed. And it really uh, helps me to offer you a new perspective that will complete uh, several uh, focuses and uh, perspectives. So, the three main questions that I'm trying to answer here in just 19 and a half minutes. The first question, does geopolitics belong to the past? What do we mean when we talk about geopolitics of technology and what's the role of the European Union, which is the government uh, framework that we have? Well, we can start with a very classical uh, saying, more than a century, this sentence says, your politics are the problems and conditions within a state that arise from its geographic feature. This is the most classical conception when we talk about uh, geopolitics. Rudolf Kettlin was a disciple from uh, Frederick Russell that was known by being the creator of uh, Vital Space. Some of the history fanatics uh, for sure will know about the uh, justification of aggressions, uh, so I'm not going to talk about it, so let me speed up. When we talk about geopolitics, we talk about a closed geographic space, military expansion, and how we conquer new interests to protect our people. This is the first map that was used. It was developed by Mackinder, which was a British scientist that uh, worked at the Royal Society, it dates from 1903. The theory was a very simple one. Uh, the one that masters the area, the pivotal area, will control the world. Very basic. Why? Because Eurasia, which has been always uh, like something very fascinating for a military strategist, had all the resources that uh, we thought that were needed to make a country prosperous by that time and to be prosperous. These are the two uh, concepts and also the resources as a concept. So, Mackinder said, if you are able to control this private area, you will control and master the world. We talk about 1903, the British Empire, Mackinder thought about the big game, the United Kingdom that had to conquer India, it has to take uh, the Central Asia and clashes with Russia. This strategy was developed to be implemented against Russia. 1944, things uh, do not change too much. Well, this is the same strategy taken by Nicholas Feynman and it's uh, given to the Pentagon in the US. And he says, we've got a problem, we have the Soviet Union advancing. How can we limit the power of the Soviet Union? We transform McKinley uh, maps. And this is geopolitics 60 something years ago. The difference between the first map and the second one, the first one was a strategy of expansion, and the second one was a contention strategy, but we play with the same resources, natural resources. The thing is that we are not anymore in 1944. The world has changed, right? Maybe not too much. When we talk about geopolitics, so we talk about the heritage continents, uh, those words coming from a, a board game called Risks. Okay, risk game, but this is not the answer because if we go 2019, 2018, we can see that how the work appears in a political speech, the European political speech. Europe, at the end of the day, was inside this continent heart, this pivot area, and unfortunately, Europe has been always the one that has suffered the most. If a maps look Europe, and in Europe we have war, we won't talk anymore about geopolitics because it's going to be very painful. When uh, Jean-Claude Juncker said this last sentence, the State of the Nation discourse, with this uh, famous sentence that says, the time for European sovereignty has come, and he was totally attacked. Many, many people in Brussels, in newspapers, in the media, uh, said, what is he saying? We talked about zero sovereignty in Europe, oh, very bad, Juncker. And suddenly, von der Leyen came and uh, 
she goes to the Paris Peace Forum, which is an initiative uh, made by uh, Macron to have the power in the cyberspace, and she says, I'm going to build this geopolitics commission. Three months went by since 2018 September till the election of von der Leyen, when he said this sentence in April 2019. The world has changed, and maybe we're coming back. But maps are not useful anymore. The flat maps, basic maps, uh, have become something very, very different. So we are not talking anymore when we talk about geopolitics. We cannot talk anymore with those terms that we are going to conquer a geographic and specific space. We will look for resources because the resources that are interesting to us are very different from the ones from the past. We do have a physical space, but we have another space which is not a physical space. I love to call it virtual space. When we talk about geopolitics, we won't talk anymore about military expansion. We talk about controlling the processes and something has changed. And suddenly we can see two new paths. We have a classical geopolicy that's one that wants to control the raw materials of these new things. What is the geopolitics of new technologies? Those resources are not anymore an exclusively raw material such as gold, such as land, um, the uh, agriculture, what we saw in the past. We talk about new raw materials such as minerals to create our technology devices, talent and data. And uh, suddenly, the physical flat conception, I pick the map and I move my shoulders, it's not useful anymore. And to have a new strategy, we need the new geopolitics, which is the geopolitics of industry, to control and to master the processes to conquer data, uh, minerals, and lands. And we don't talk anymore about geopolitics like occupying a very specific space. There is a battle to have access to key resources that will help us, that will allow us to progress inside the idea of progress, that it's more a digital progress. So uh, we can witness many, many things, such as emerging technologies, as Michael mentioned before, and many ways to get related to read the information, have access, and to spread the information, and to disseminate the information. Well, the second trend, which is the industrial uh, geopolitics, I mean the process control uh, that goes beyond the idea of who is going to control these standards, which could be one of the paths, but also who is going to control air, dye, Aaron D and I, who has access to the value chain. How can we get ready facing the new clashes, what has happened during the pandemics with the microchip production? Who has access to talent? How we can retain the talent? How can we make talent to work for us? This part is very interesting when we talk about critical education and also how can we set priorities? What really interests us, who are we working with? At the end of the day, it's not a physical expansion to be with the boots on the field, we talk about accumulation of uh, uh, goods and services. And in Europe, when we talk about geopolitics, we do not talk anymore about the vital space. The only way to accumulate the processes has to do with uh, the idea that we developed uh, several years ago, uh, digital sovereignty strategy. Uh, digital sovereignty, it's um, much interesting than uh, strategic autonomy because it came from the military world. We had several waves and the final one is called open uh, strategic autonomy. Uh, this is a sentence that we have in, uh, from von der Leyen of the State of the Union. We'll invest in alliances and coalitions to advance our values. We will promote and protect Europe's interests through open and fair trade together with values. We will strengthen our partners uh, through cooperation because, and this sentence it's key to, my, to me, because strong uh, partners make Europe strong too. Well. When we talk about uh, strategic autonomy or geopolitics in the European context, how can we get this political vision, this uh, engine, this uh, manufacturing engine, who is going to be our partner for these three anchors to uh, get consolidated in a specific manner? It has to do a lot with values, but also with resources, right? We don't have everything in our hands. We cannot have everything in our hands. Otherwise, this would stop innovation. And it could be a break for this to transcumulation and control. In the end, they will go against citizenship, right? So if you want to control and to master everything, you must be able to 
control and to assess, to detect what are the uh, flaws and to correct the flaws in a much more techno technical world will be more complex. As an example, well, we have this uh, image, uh, the chip's low. What does it do? It takes these three anchors, which were this political vision, the technological vision, and this uh, industrial availability to uh, produce something that has been one of the main failures of uh, European technology, which has been the lack of microchips. Uh, well, it's very weird to me to clarify this. Yes, just a minute. It's going to be very difficult, but those uh, key components, uh, microchips, to produce almost everything, they are uh, concentrated in Korea and Taiwan. Uh, they realize that they have other issues, such uh, as accumulating uh, boats in the Suez Canal. Uh, they never reach on time. So we can produce at home if we want to pick them uh, far away or we want to bring it here closer to us the thing is that we have not the capacity we are not uh, able to set this uh, primacy all along this value chain we only had two percent for design and five percent uh, for the assembly in europe so we need to improve this uh, microchip problem and in order to conclude we are aiming to that's interesting to me. The geopolitics problems shows that we are very interdependent. We are accumulating and protecting. And Simona, I promise you, I'm going to stop here. We can do it through something that we call it in English the weaponization of interdependence, that very badly translated as secretization of interdependence, because at the end of the day, it comes from this idea. And what I really want to share with you it is to know how can we control these uh, processes through our alliances and how can we be the the ones that have access and doesn't have access because it's going against these two things that I can see key because in this sentence I can see the values, the interest. So what we can witness, it is this uh, trend such as uh, it was happening in Hugo, uh, well, I don't care about what is happening, uh, someone is getting stronger, I'm going to play with my allies, and this is the idea I want to conclude with. Together we'll be stronger and we can make this possible. If we are all together and we are enough people, we are able to set the partnerships and several alliances to make this possible, we will stop these negative trends such as uh, accumulation. That's all. I was uh, fast enough, hope painless. My virtual door, it's always open. I'll be here for these three days. Any kind of ideas that you want to share with me, any question, I'll be here for you and with you. Well, I just offer you an overview of uh, several topics. Some of the topics have not been clear enough, but that's all. Thank you so much.